from the worldwide leader in sports. This is an ESPN News special presentation of the NFL Draft. of the NFL Draft on ESPN. The quarterbacks have often moved to the head of the class. But rarely has there been a class like this one. They're young, mobile, and rocket armed, ready to take dead aim at the upper half of the first round, where all five are sure to be snagged. Can the class of 99 be the class of 83 with Dan Marino, with Jim Kelly, and with John Elway? Here comes QB99, the next generation. Now set, throws for the end zone, touchdown, Kentucky, I don't believe, what did you saw? He's off the races, it's a Syracuse, touchdown, Donovan McNam. Dante drops, looks, looks, now rolls out, he's free to the 10, to the 5, touchdown, Culpepper. McNam is going to run it at the 5, dives in oh. the end zone, absolutely unbelievable. And now he's going to throw to the end zone. It is caught. Touchdown. What a play by Akili Smith. And what a beautiful pass. Quarterback, the greatest names in the game playing the toughest position in all of sports. When the doors open to the 21st century, will the last draft of the 20th century forever make its mark? They have gathered in the Big Apple, the biggest of the players, all the NFL teams, and fans of all 31 to join us here at the theater and the quarterbacks five of them may go before halfway through the first round we've never had that before and the running back after the qbs the other issue ricky williams the 6,000 yard heisman trophy winner where does he go we'll find that out here today and tomorrow as espn begins our coverage of the 64th annual selection meeting which in English is known as the NFL Draft. Hi, I'm Chris Berman. We are here in New York. We are in Bristol, and we are everywhere. We will be able to go to eight different NFL cities during the course of the draft. It sounds like a Chuck Berry. And Indianapolis. Seattle. You're going to get the Mike Holmgren era. Minnesota. New Orleans. Pull the biggest of all draft day deals and the Super Bowl champion Denver Broncos. We will video conference with just about everywhere else in the NFL. Basically, if you have a Rand McNally Atlas in the United States, we have got you covered for this draft. And not only do we have you covered on our coverage today and tomorrow, 17 hours worth, you can keep up on ESPN News, ESPN.com if you have the skills, and ESPN Radio. Welcome here to New York where the Cleveland Browns are on the clock. We had some drama last night and that their man, Tim Couch, quarterback Kentucky, could they get a deal done? In the wee hours of the morning, there was a breakthrough, and in a few moments, we expect to hear Tim Couch, number one pick. But it wasn't that simple. Let's go out to an excited Cleveland Browns headquarters and join our Sal Palantonio. Not a lot of sleep there last night, Sal. Well, Chris, what happened was that Tom Condon the chief negotiator for IMG who represents Tim Couch got wind that the chief negotiator for the Browns, Lyle Hennigan, was talking to Achilles Smith's agent, Lee Steinberg. This was about uh, 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock last night when Condon was out having dinner with Tim Couch. So he rushed over to Hennigan's room in the same hotel, the Millennium down, downtown there, and uh, he got there at about 11, 11.30. I actually called up Hennigan's room to find out what was going on with the negotiations, and Tom Condon answered the telephone. And so uh, it was pretty heavy negotiation until about four hours, until about three in the morning, but they finally reached an agreement in principle on a seven-year deal worth $48 million. There's a $12.25 million signing bonus up front. It's the highest to any rookie in NFL history. With incentives, the deal could reach $59.4 million. It's a big deal for Tim Couch. It's a big deal for the city of Cleveland. The number one pick of the new Cleveland Browns will be Kentucky quarterback Tim Couch, Chris. Well, Sal, out of deference to the owner, Al Lerner, who is here in New York for this historic day, this historic pick, they may have got the deal done at 3, but they didn't want to wake him up till about 7 or 7.30 to get the okay. So, you know, when you own the team, you get to sleep through the night a little bit. But it is done, and Tim Couch is here in New York. So is Ricky Williams, and we expect 
quarterbacks to go one, Donovan McNabb two to Philadelphia, probably Achilles Smith three to Cincinnati. Then the fun may begin at the fourth spot, Indianapolis. Traded Marshall Falk a couple of uh, days ago to the St. Louis Rams. Who will run the ball? Is it Ricky Williams? Is it someone else? Do they do something else with their number four pick? Very interesting indeed. Sean Salisbury is at Colts headquarters in Indianapolis. What's the latest there, Sean? Chris, there's a lot going on. First and foremost, with the trade of Marshall Falk to the St. Louis Rams, everybody assumed that, that paved the way to get the obvious pick would be Ricky Williams running back from Texas. But don't be so sure about that. This football team, when you talk about Marshall Falk, said it would have been a distraction in training camp because he was going to hold out guaranteed because all the money he wanted. So they had to look elsewhere. When you talk about the players that are out there for them, you go into a meeting room and it's all about emotion in this draft. You talk to Polian, you talk to Jim Mora, you mention the players and they kind of go through the pluses and minuses. You talk about Georgia cornerback Champ Bailey and they go crazy. They are in love with this kid. You'd think that it was their child. And remember Bill Polian and Jim Mora both have built defenses wherever they've been. Don't be surprised if that Georgia corner is right here in Indianapolis today. Let's go out to Ed Werder in New Orleans. Well, Sean, as you know, the Saints have no real reason to trust that the Colts are going to pass on Ricky Williams at four to take Champ Bailey. Now, Mike Ditka tells me that he's got a tentative agreement in place, if that does happen, to go ahead and make a trade with Washington uh, for the 12th pick, for the fifth spot, move up, get Ricky Williams there. But they're not content with that. They're still exploring possibilities of moving in front of the Colts. They've talked to Cincinnati this morning. Cincinnati's, uh, as Mike Ditka put it, their uh, request was outrageous. They want all of the Saints' top picks this year, plus their first rounder through the year 2002. Chris, Mike Ditka says he's not willing to pay that. Well, Mike is ready still, Ed, to make a deal that we have never really had uh, on draft day. But it will all unravel here in the next 17 hours, 10 hours today, 7 hours tomorrow. Mel, your top five picks, if everything was equal, you would go running back, wouldn't you? I would. Ricky Williams, I think, is going to be a franchise back. Chris Edger and James on his heel. Chris Claiborne can play middle linebacker or on the outside. And Champ Bailey, we know about that tremendous versatility he'll provide an offense and a defense. You know, I didn't give you the proper drum roll. Mel Kuyper, Joe Theismann working with me, as always, in a camp of thousands. The commissioner will open it. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the National Football League's 64th Annual College Player Draft. We want to thank all of you fans here for being with us in New York. And we also want to thank the millions of fans around the country who are watching ESPN's 20th telecast of the NFL Draft. Today, the first selection choice belongs to the Cleveland Browns, who are now on the clock. The crowd is certainly revved up here now. Joe Theismann, you've scattered all these quarterbacks. Tim Couch, Achille Smith, even the other ones, McNown, Cole Pepper, and uh, Donovan McNabb. You making the pick, where do you go? Well, first of all, Chris, let me just say this. Every one of the quarterbacks has something that they're going to need to work on as they get ready to play in the National Football League. Tim Couch, as you look at his statistics, has an advantage because he's played a lot more football than Achille Smith. Achille Smith, probably a lot more natural athlete. And the quarterback position now has become one where they're looking for a lot more athletes. But i got to be honest with you, if I was going to take one, I would probably have taken Cade McDown from UCLA, only because I think his technical skills are the best of any quarterback in this particular draft. Mel, that's because he likes the short quarterback, see? Well, I, I mean, I'll tell you what, I don't buy that. I think you would trade down if you were interested in case. No, I would not. No. We're going to start this on, already. Joe. Yes, we, we will. We just started this thing here. Well, it's early, but we'll start. Tim Couch, I think an outstanding quarterback prospect. Talk about the run and shoot. He adjusted to how Mummy when he got there. He had been throwing the football tremendously well in high school, whipping it around the field. Then he went to a run and shoot type attack, two-step drop, get the ball off quickly. You see the ball placement up around the ear. He's already dropped that during that second workout with Chris Palmer. So he's already made the necessary adjustments. Talked to him yesterday. He is putting the ball accurately with more velocity than he had since his high school days. 36 points per game with a hardwood in high school. He really utilizes that ability in terms of accuracy on the football field. And I look at Tim Cap, 6'4", 225, tremendous escape ability. Watch him, escape here, vision down the field, 
accurately deliver the football. I think that's what's underrated about Couch is this athleticism that he brings to the quarterback position as well as the enthusiasm. He's kind of mild-mannered off the field, low-key. When he puts the pads on, he turns up the intensity dial. Watch me throw across his body to Craig Yeast in the end zone. Here, whip a strike in the end zone for a touchdown to Yeast again. Watch me throw across his body here against Penn State for the touchdown. Questionable arm strength. Think again. Tim Capps now feels like he is throwing the ball and is more comfortable than he's ever been. Look at that completion percentage. That's where the accuracy comes in. And he did this, Chris, against SEC competition, against some of the best athletes in the country. Tim Capps, to me, has a chance to be a superlative NFL quarterback. Well, 36 touchdowns, 15 interceptions last year, 72%. You mentioned almost 4,300 yards. Joe, there was a little question on the way he throws. But when you look at these guys over and over, are we being nitpickers? Yeah, we certainly are, Chris. And if I'm going to spend $27 million on somebody, I'm going to nitpick even. I'm going to nitpick by nitpicking. You have to look at him very closely. The reason I looked at Tim Couch as close as I did is I was uncomfortable with his grip. He has his, four, his index finger up real high on the ball. That causes him to palm the ball a little bit more and not really get the pop on it. When you look at the release, you look at the revolutions, the ball just looks like it just hangs in the air with a little bit of a wobble. And then here, you can count the revolutions when he releases the ball into the flat. This is a total of five revolutions, and the ball travels some 20 yards. That is not efficient nor sufficient enough to be able to go out and throw the ball well. Had a chance to sit with him last night. He's changed his grip. The, pi the picture on your right screen shows what he used to do where he didn't use the laces. And now you see him move his fingers back a little bit so that his pinky is on the laces. He's able to re re get more revolutions on the ball, therefore making it a tighter spiral and a harder throw. You talk about five revolutions. I got American, French, and Russian. What are the other two revolutions? The other two, Mexican? I'm going to come up with the okay, other two. All right, all right. Well, we, well, we go through the history books. There are some hot spots, certainly below where the quarterbacks are being selected. Maybe as early as the third pick, Cincinnati. Hot spots, hot buttons. Who better to discuss it? Mike Tirico, Chris Mortensen. Fellas? All right, Chris, thank you. If more decisions are made at one and two, is Cincinnati fielding offers, and what are they thinking about trading the number three pick? We heard Ed talk about Well, as Ed Werder mentioned, yes, Cincinnati is talked with the New Orleans Saints, but they have also made an outrageous demand of the, uh, New, of the Saints. And here's what's going to happen. Right now, they are pretty much sold on their number one quarterback, Akili Smith. They will listen to New Orleans one last time if the Saints want to call. When they're on the clock, I think they're taking Achilles Smith. If that's a tepid spot, then we've got the really hot spots where people are talking deal. Sean alluded to it at number four. Well, Ricky Williams right now holds the key, at least to the drama, I think, in this draft, and that is whether the Colts take him or not, and whether the Saints deal with Washington Redskins. Then it becomes really fluid at six with St. Louis and Chicago, and a couple other trades to talk about here. Quarterback deals. The Ravens have got a deal in the works for Tony Banks from St. Louis. Then the Ravens will deal Eric Zire to Tampa Bay. Oh, this this concerns Dante Culpepper sure. and all those things. Oakland tried to trade up to get Dante Culpepper. The headline story, though, from 4 to 11 could be deals done. That's right. We got Hot some fun there. Hot spots to watch for sure. Boom. All right, guys. Well, we could have the five quarterbacks as early as the 10 spot, 11, or certainly by 15. That has never happened before in the history of the NFL draft. History making day. We'll be back. The Cleveland Browns, great history, and the history resumed here in 1999. The Browns are on the clock, and there is the look uh, inside the war room. Carmen Policy, the dapperly dressed Carmen Policy, would expect nothing less. The vice president, GM, and former hero in San Francisco, now hopefully hero in Cleveland, Dwight Clark is in there in the Browns. Of course, not a lot of suspense, but they have 13 picks throughout the day. We will go there early and often. Will this class of 99 be similar to the class of 1983, in which John Elway was drafted, you forget, by Baltimore, but of course, by the end of the day, uh, he was traded, and the rest was history. Todd Blackledge by the Chiefs was the next pick that year. Look at the youngster, Jim Kelly, by the Bills, but he was playing the USFL. Tony Easton led the Patriots to a Super Bowl. Ken O'Brien had a good career with the Jets, and some guy named Marino, the sixth quarterback taken in 1983 he's had a decent career with the miami dolphins elway marino and maybe jimbo hall of famers from that draft so the question does this draft in 1999 
compared to that draft in 1983? You can only grade on the way they came out. How does it shape up at this time, though? Numbers-wise, it compares. I think mobility-wise, this group in 1999 has the edge. I think pure passing ability coming from pro-style attack, the 83 class had the edge. And how much that will translate into these quarterbacks needing some time to develop We'll have to find out, and Joe, I think that's the big question. Will this group be able to come in there, force-fed now in the NFL? How quickly will these quarterbacks have an impact in the NFL? I don't care about the 83 class. What about the 71 class? <laughs> when you had Plunkett, you had Manning, you had Pastorini. Oh, by the way, they went 1-2-3 in the draft. There also happened to be a fourth-round pick by the name of Theismann that played in that particular class. Not that I'm prejudiced about it one bit, but I do, th <laughs> I do think that, as Mel alluded to it, that the biggest difference in this group of young men coming out is the thing that you have to stress and look at is their athletic ability. Every one of them has exceptional athletic ability, and they have to to play against the defenses today in the National Football League. Everybody wants the quarterback to be able to move around, slide in a pocket, make plays. Every one of these quarterbacks has that ability, but every one of them has a lot of things that they have to work on before they can get to the level where you can call them bona fide stars in the National Football League. The guy that was drafted in 71 was Thiesman, wasn't it? That's it wasn't right. It was, it was actually, it was Thiesman. It was Thiesman, actually. Yeah, but it was, it was still a debate. I think it was <laughs> Thiesman. Boy, Mike, Jim Kelly was a young pup once upon a time. That was an interesting picture, wasn't it? <laughs> it certainly was. He has 101 wins in the class of 83's total. Class of 83, by the way, 160 games over 500 as NFL starters. Is this class better? What's the biggest difference? I think the biggest difference is the athletic ability of these quarterbacks. I mean, you look at all the Dante Culpepper, uh, runs a 4'6", 4 4'5", 4 I mean, 250 pounds. They have the mobility to make the play on the run. The class of 83, more of a pocket-style pass. Dan Marino, Don Elway, yes, he could get around. Myself, pretty much like to stay in the pocket, but that's the biggest difference, probably the athletic ability and them being able to make things happen on the run. Project for me as we look at the production of this class. Will they be better than you guys when it all said and done? They put up great numbers in uh, in their uh, college days, just like you guys did, but look at these pro numbers you I guys mean, put you, up. I mean, you can't compare that. 484 wins amongst us. Maybe six, seven years from now, maybe you'll be able to say something about that. But uh, 11 Super Bowls, 484 wins. Only, yeah, only Kenny with 50 and 59 record was the only one of that group under 500 for his career. More from Jim and Boomer Sison later on. Head back to Boomer Berman. That's quite a class. A class that's made its mark on the NFL for two decades. And now let's go up to the commissioner for the first, first pick of the new Cleveland. In the 1999 draft, the Cleveland Browns selection is from the University of Kentucky quarterback Tim Couch. This is a young man from a town of 350, Hyden, Kentucky, coal mining town in southeastern Kentucky. The nearest movie theater is 25 miles away. The nearby towns, his dad, Albert, is from Thousand Six, Kentucky. <laughs> Hell for certain Kentucky is right down the road. Hazard, Kentucky is right down the road. And from that small town, Tim Couch has proven himself at the University of Kentucky. He's made everyone in the community and the state proud. And now he is the first player selected ever by the Cleveland Browns. It's a wild ride, but you know, I think he has his feet on the ground. We spoke with him a little bit last night. And by the way, welcome back to the NFL, Cleveland Browns. We did miss you very much, so. It'd be good to see the new dog pound again. Tim Couch in Cleveland. And they have Ty Detmer there, so the pressure is not for him to play right away, guys. No, it's not. And I think, uh, and Joe, we can get to the, the how quickly he'll be ready. But I look at Tim Couch, and it gets back to Achilles Smith just about two, three weeks ago, moving ahead of Tim Couch after that first workout. Chris Palmer challenging Tim Couch. During that second workout last Sunday, Tim Couch responded, showed Chris Palmer exactly what he wanted to see. They offered the delivery, they offered the grip, and Tim Couch went out, Joe, and had an outstanding workout. And that showed Chris Palmer that he had the kind of quarterback he wants to go to war with, not for this next year or the year after, but for about 10 years. Keep in mind, he is a junior coming out, so that means he's going to grow, he's going to mature. I think probably one of the things that impressed Chris Palmer as much as anything, when he did change his grip, it made a difference in the way he threw the football. It made a difference for Tim Couch on how he felt like he could throw the football. Just making minor adjustments to a quarterback and getting results is something very positive for a coach to look at. The young man from Hyden, Kentucky, selected by the Cleveland Browns. We have a series of pieces throughout the draft that we know as in the crosshairs. Let's get to know Tim Couch. I'm Tim Couch, University of Kentucky. 
you know, it was kind of like Mayberry on Andy Griffith show. You know, everybody knew everybody. We got, you know, one cop, one stoplight, a couple restaurants, and, you know, it was just your typical small town. The big advantage for me was I didn't have anything to do all day long but throw a football. I just wanted to go somewhere that, you know, kind of a road less traveled that a lot of people didn't take, and, you know, all the top recruits were going to these big-name schools and stuff, and I just said, uh, you know, hey, I'm going to do something different for a change. Fortunate for me, they brought in Coach Mummy. He brings in the system that, uh, you know, is perfect for me. I got receivers around me. I got a big offensive line protecting me, and uh, things just fell into place for me. I don't believe what I just saw. I having dinner with Joe Montana was, um, you know, really unbelievable. That was, uh, you know, my childhood hero. You know, a guy, you know, you, you sit there and eat dinner with him, and all these plays he made are, you know, flashing through my mind. You know, the, the catch, the slant he threw against the Bengals to win the Super Bowl. All those plays are going through your mind when you first meet him. I watched the guys like Montana and Marino and Elway and those guys growing up. It, uh, you know, really just made you dream a lot as a little kid and, and uh, something to work for. I just got to go learn a new offense. You know, w once I get that offense in, you know, in my mind where, where it comes second nature like the offense that Kentucky was, where I'm not out there thinking through things, I'm just... You know, bam, 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 re making my reads, progressions. I think, um, you know, I'm going to adjust fine, and I think I got the, you know, the talent's just going to naturally come through. Well, Tim Couch stays in the Midwest. You have to drive through Daniel Boone National Forest to get to Hyden, Kentucky, which also, this is interesting, was the site of the pr first post-resignation speech by Richard Nixon. I I I'm not sure why it was there, but for Tim Couch today, to borrow from Nixon, he is the president, at least in Cleveland. The Philadelphia Eagles with their fans, who are many here. Is it Donovan McNabb? We sure think so. We'll talk about who's coming up in New York in a moment. Come on. Apple Chevrolet Tinley Park announces a major reduction in every used and programmed vehicle in stock during Apple Chevrolet's Red Tag sales event. Every used vehicle will be clearly marked with bottom line prices. Look for the red tags and save. Now through Saturday, Apple Chevrolet, smart people, smart sales, smart service. Located on 159th Street in Tinley Park, Apple Chevrolet, the smart choice. Mirabale means fashion. Mirabale means style. Mirabali means shoes. For fun. For the future. For the entire family. Mirabali shoes in Orland Park. Jerry Maguire, that was a real thrill. Quite a few of us auditioned for parts. Show me the money! Show me the money. Show me the money! You complete me. You complete me. Help me help you. Who's coming with me? Who's coming with me? Let's go. Who's coming with me? There were a couple of performances that really surprised them. You had me at hello. You had me at hello. We are back in New York. Now, the Jets don't draft till late in the second round. But there's a team of green here in full force. Those are the Eagles fans who are making their last pitch for the Eagles to draft Ricky Williams and not quarterback Donovan McNabb. More on that in a moment. But Cleveland has made their pick. Let's go out now to Sal Palantonio with the president, Carmen Policy. Sal? Well, that's right. I'm with one of your good friends, Carmen Policy. And Carmen, it was a long, arduous process to pick the right guy. Why did you go with Tim Couch? Well, we, we love everything we learned about him and when you talk about what he can do on the field I think all of your listeners and viewers have been exposed through ES ESPN coverage as to how qualified and how talented he is but off the field uh, he displayed so much character and poise and he, he's such a solid human being and when we saw how coachable he was especially during that workout in Lexington Kentucky at the University of Kentucky I mean all of us got blown away by that and I think that's what really pushed Chris Palmer over the uh, over the line. You took great pains to get him to come to an agreement before you decided to put in a selection. Why was that important to you? It's it's important because we needed our leader, our leader on the field, committed to the Browns the moment he became a Brown. We could not tolerate even for 20 seconds 
any kind of an interruption or disruption of his focus, and God forbid that there would even be a, a one-day holdout. Uh, it, we needed this commitment to this organization to send a message to everyone else who's going to be part of this team. Thanks a lot, Carmen. Looks like they've got their guy, Tim Couch, the Kentucky quarterback, the new pick of the Cleveland Browns. Chris? And there's the official reaction a few moments ago by the Cleveland Browns and Coach Chris Palmer. There's Carmen right there, so you can uncork the, the wine. Carmen, who knows his way around a wine list, certainly at the end of this draft will have 13 picks, but he knows now number one, Tim Couch. So, now on the clock, the Philadelphia Eagles and their new regime, quarterback guru, late of the staff of Mike Holmgren, Andy Reid. Eagles in the 90s started out fine. Randall Cunningham, they were contenders, of course, at least a you know, playoff team a couple of times. Never quite got over the hump to get going in the playoffs. Remember, the Fog Bowl was one of them. Then Rodney Pete and Ty Detmer, who is now at Cleveland. Last year, Bobby Hoying, and they tried Jim McMahon. Basically, they're a team in search of an offense, because their offense last year for a 3-13 team was anemic. However, Andy Reid and Tom Modrak, it should be, it was reported that maybe they were differing on who they like. Not the case. They agree it's Donovan McNabb. And one of the things they like is that he's started for four years at Syracuse. The pick is coming in. Let's go up uh, to the commissioner, make it official. And you know the Eagles fans are hoping running back. We'll see. With the uh, second pick, the Philadelphia Eagles select Donovan McNabb, quarterback, Syracuse University. Donovan McNabb is a four-year starter in college. 
One of the reasons Brett Favre was able to play so well so quickly was that he had four years of starting at Southern Miss. And that experience will go in a big way to help Donovan McNabb be a major contributor for a long time at Eagles. And don't take it out on him. He's an exciting player, a great athlete. You're absolutely right, Chris. There's one thing I want to talk about as far as him working in Syracuse. In Syracuse, the type of offense they ran, it forced people to play a lot of man-to-man -man coverage against them. In doing so, he threw a lot of man-to-man -man routes. i got to be perfectly honest with you. If i got a young quarterback coming out of college who's worked against man-to-man -man coverage, I think that's a big plus. I think anybody can come out of college and throw the ball for 500 yards a game against zones. That's easy to teach. Throwing the ball against man-to-man -man coverage is something more difficult. But I like the way Donovan McNabb has been able to put his package together as a quarterback and do the things that he needs to do. First of all, he has excellent ball position. You see the ball up high right there. That's excellent position for a ball, standing nice and tall in the pocket. Now, as he moves around and scrambles around, he shows the athletic ability. Here he is on the move, resets the ball to the same identical position, which allows him to throw the ball with accuracy. He's a little stiff in his drop back. I'd like to see him work the ball a little bit more, and he takes that ball hand off the ball. That he has to learn to do. Hang on to the ball a little bit more for protection. He makes himself small when he gets back in the pocket. What I mean is he drops down so low, you're going to get down where you're going to lose sight of defensive back. Those are some of the things that are very easily correctable by a quarterback. It's the athletic ability, the arm strength, the intangibles that I really believe is going to make him exceptional. I think he has a terrific upside, Chris. I really do. For the third time in the 90s, this year, last year, of course, with Manning and Leaf, and in 93 with Bledsoe and Meyer, quarterbacks 1-2. Mortimer, Donovan McNabb, certainly a lot of experience as a starter. Well, and that's right. And here's what went into some of the thought processes as it pertains to Donovan McNabb with the Andy Reid, the new Philadelphia coach. Remember, this is a quarterback-driven offense. And, and Andy Reid really sees some of Brett Favre and Donovan McNabb. That's credentials enough. He thinks he's by far the best athlete in the draft, even better than Champ Bailey. He thinks he can play four skill positions in the NFL. And not only that, but the offense, this West Coast offense, the number one pass play, hey, we talk about the option, is the play action. It's the sprint, draw, fake, blast, and that's exactly what he thinks McNabb will do. And he's also going to make this very much a character draft, and McNabb, Chris, falls right in line with that. Well, Donovan McNabb, as you mentioned, an outstanding uh, uh, athlete. And they have Doug Peterson there, who is almost like a quarterback, but also kind of like a coach in this offense. Will McNabb start right away? Probably not. Will he start at all this year? They'll have to wait and see. But they're going to be patient with him, give him a chance to look, and then give him a chance to contribute. Solomon Wilcox, former Bengal, our colleague, is in New England right now for a hot spot, but your former team, Solomon, on the clock, Cincinnati. Do they take Akili Smith? Are they fielding offers? What do you think? Well, Chris, they are listening to everyone. They're sitting idly by, and they're taking all the calls. But I just got off the phone, and I talked with people with the Cincinnati Bengals and they told me that they would prefer to stay put and use that third pick. Now with Donovan McNabb gone, with Tim Couch gone, I look for the Bengals to take Achilles Smith. They like his strong arm and his accuracy, Chris. Well, there's no question, Solomon, that uh, he has a major league arm. The question on Achilles, he hasn't played that much. It's one of the most meteoric rises in the history of the NFL draft. Achilles on the phone is Mike Brown at the other end. We'll be back. To it just don't fit. Move that body, girl. You be the ultimate. Put your hands in the sky and do that dance. Show us. Uh, Strong. Excuse me? Dial 1 800 call ATT for guaranteed cheap collect calls. That's right. Feel it in your center. Some people call it retirement planning. I think of this as future construction. Year by year, block by block, until it's our dream house. First. The Bengals will not entertain trade offers. The pick is in. Let's go to the podium. With the uh, third choice, the Cincinnati Bengals select Achilles Smith, quarterback, University of Oregon. The Indianapolis Colts are now on the clock. Achilles Smith, a duck. Trying to follow 
in the footsteps of Oregon quarterbacks like Hall of Famer Dan Fouts. A rocket arm who skyrocketed up the charts in the NFL right, draft so like not only no quarterback, but maybe like no player we have seen in one year, Mel. No question about it, Chris. He was basically an undrafted free agent when the season started, moved way up the draft board into the second round, then into the first round, then into the mid-first round. Then he was even being discussed a couple weeks ago as maybe the number one pick overall. You watch Achilles Smith, the tight spiral, the RPN, and the productivity this year. Remember, they called the one-year wonder. He put it all together this season. Watch this fall. Look at that release. Look at that tight spiral and the zip on the football. Unbelievable arm strength. John Elway, Burt Jones type arm strength. That's what Achilles Smith possesses. And I think that's the difference with Achilles Smith. The arm strength there, the mobility as well. Watch him here against Michigan State. Not only avoid, but then have the sense to spot that receiver open in the end zone. Here again, the mobility and the speed. He's out racing defensive back to the end zone here. So you're talking about a special athlete who this year, watch the touch coming up on this pass, Joe. This is something he could not do as a junior. He did as a senior, especially late in the year. Over the last four games, and watch the accuracy here. Over the last four games, after Reuben Drones, their fine running back, was injured, Achilles Smith threw 13 touchdown passes, only one interception. He carried that team on his shoulder. He matured a great deal, put those off-the-field problems behind him. Remember, he played three years in baseball in the minor league organization with the Pittsburgh Pirates. I think when you look at Achilles Smith, I talked to him last night, seems like he's really excited. Yes. It feels like he came out of nowhere. He just wants the opportunity to compete for a starting job in the NFL. And I, I tell you, what a meteoric rise from an undrafted free agent at the beginning of the year to maybe, you know, you're talking about even a number one pick, now the number three pick to Cincinnati. Well, we talked about the Oregon pedigree with Fouts, and he's now the, you know, the 12th quarterback to go to the NFL. High school in San Diego that produced Terrell Davis and Marcus Allen. So there's, there's pretty good, at least pedigree there, at least if you're looking at it from horse lines. More on Achilles in a moment. So quarterbacks have gone one, two, three. The second pick, Donovan McNabb, is the first choice in the new regime of the Philadelphia Eagles. Joining us now on the sprint video conference from Philadelphia is uh, the new head coach, and we'd like to introduce him to everybody, uh, Andy Reid, who uh, has a key part of the Packers' success under Mike Holmgren and his tutelage of Brett Favre. Well, Andy, uh, welcome. You've got your man, and uh, this is a guy that a lot of people said you'd have to scratch your head. Who would you pick? You were very much decided on why Donovan McNabb, correct? I sure was. Yes, Boomer, I, I felt very strong about him. Uh, what, a, what a fine person we're getting, and likewise, a fine football player. Andy, we discussed on the phone, you and I, that the type of offense that he had at Syracuse is in some way similar to the West Coast offense that you will run. Will you elaborate on that a little bit? Well, Chris, I'll tell you what, it, it really is. I had an opportunity to break down the film on, on Donovan and pull out plays, number one, that I felt were timing routes that might fit into the West Coast offense. One where he came back, he had to anticipate what the defense was going to do and then make the play. I thought he did that uh, with, with tremendous accuracy. Uh, he was able to keep his eyes down the field, uh, do, do some of the things that we, we want him to do in this West Coast uh, system. Andy, is there pressure to play? I mean, not quite yet, but what is a timetable? I know we're sitting in April. The timetable for him to play and for him to start. Do you see it late this year? Do you see it this year at all? Do you see it right away? What are you thinking right now? I know it's April. Well, Chris, that again, that's a little bit of the crystal ball theory. I brought Doug Peterson in here to uh, play football for me, and I did that uh, with a plan in mind. Not only does Doug come in, and uh, give me a security blanket from the quarterback position, but he also is a person that can help teach Donovan the ins and outs of uh, this offense. And uh, Doug will come in and be the number one quarterback and, and give Donovan an opportunity to, to learn. Good luck in Philadelphia. We know we'll be hearing from you later again today. You've got your guy, and uh, hey, these fans will turn around here in New York. I'll work on them, all right? No, I understand that. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate it. Take care, all fellas. Right, Andy. Andy Reid, who will really, it'll be interesting to see how that Eagles offense develops in that West Coast style. Back to Achilles Smith. Mel, 
last year at this time, where was he? Was he in this book, the Mel Kuyper draft report? I mean, was he in here? <laughs> he was barely. Uh, he was a co-starter, of course, as a junior with Jason Moss, who will probably be a late-rounder undrafted free agent. Look at the quarterbacks. Dante Culpepper, a huge grade going into the year. Ted White at Howard could be a third or fourth round pick. Nice grade. Tate McNown, Joe's favorite, a 54. That's a nice grade for him. Michael Bishop, who may change position. See Chad Salisbury from the University of Buffalo. Mike Cook, William & Mary. Jason Vandermott, Alma, all on the same level of Achille Smith. So you can see where he came from to get to this point where he's the number three pick overall. And Joe, I tell you what, you talk about a meteoric ri rise up the tr uh, charts. None other than Achille Smith, probably in the history of the NFL draft. It really was. And I had a chance to talk to Jeff Ted for his offensive coordinator and his quarterback coach at Oregon. The thing that impressed me about him is he's, Jeff said we worked real hard on his pocket skills, and you could see him respond to that. They work real hard on him studying and learning and understanding what it takes to be a quarterback, more than just the athletic part of it. He understood that. Having a chance to sit and visit with him last night, I asked him about Peyton Manning and Ryan Leaf. I said, what did you learn from last year? He said, I heard Peyton put those tapes in his car right away, started studying. Those are the things that I'm going to need to do to get everybody's confidence on this football team. So the lessons of last year's quarterbacks have carried over to this year's quarterbacks. They know how hard they're going to have to study and work. And he's a young man who proved he can dedicate himself to becoming a better football player. You always like to see a guy, Chris, continue to improve and improve. This is a kid who made up his mind and has done it. The quarterbacks have gone, and now, as Paul Harvey would say, we begin to have the rest of the story. <laughs> this, you would think, with Indianapolis, may be the spot for a running back. You would think it would be Ricky Williams. And Sean Salisbury's with us, Indianapolis, you told us at the beginning of the draft, maybe Ricky, maybe Adrian James, maybe Champ Bailey. If I'm the Colts, I got to think about a back, but it may not be the back that everybody's thinking of. It might be Adrian James. What are you hearing? I'll tell you, Boomer, they like both of those backs. One they like better outside, James. Ricky Williams inside. But let's not just focus on offense. Yeah, Marshall Falk gone. You think, got to have a running back. They think there might be a quality one in the second round also. And Bill Polian told me that if three quarterbacks went one, two, three, it would be a 75% chance or better they went defense first. And you think Georgia cornerback Champ Bailey, who they love, and a running back in the second round. Should be interesting on the clock. We're going to find out soon enough. Let's get out to New Orleans and Ed Werder. Well, Sean, the uh, Saints here have been desperately trying to trade up with the Colts for this pick, but the Colts have refused all trade offers, including a deal that would feature all of this year's draft plus ones and threes next year and a one the following year. They have not been able to move into that position. The Colts telling them they're taking a player that they want that's on the board. Now the question is, is it Champ Bailey or is it Ricky Williams? If they pass on Ricky Williams, the Saints have a deal in place with the Redskins to take Ricky Williams with the five pick. Chris, back to you. All right, Ed, we will see what happens. Uh, Mel, well, let's look at the, the, of course, anybody will pale in comparison to the running statistics of the Heisman Trophy winner, Ricky Williams. I mean, these are career numbers. Of Ricky with over 6,200 rushing for Texas. Edgerin James, really two-year starter at Miami. Although, you know, 3,000 yards in two years is not too bad. If you compare and contrast these two, Mel, what would edge you one way, no pun intended, what would edge you another way? Gave a slight edge, certainly, to Ricky Williams. I think staying around for four years. Remember, he would have been the sixth pick overall last year had he come out, went back, broke all those records. Boy, he put up big numbers, worked on his pass receiving, cut down on the fumbles, although he did have one late against Texas A&M. I think Ricky Williams gives a slight edge to Edger and James did it over this season, late in the year against UCLA and their big upset went over the Bruins and against NC State. But when he was on this year, he was unstoppable. Eric Dickerson type size and breakaway speed in the best hands of any back upgraded in a long, long time. So Edgerin James almost caught Ricky Williams, but you have to give the edge to Williams because he did it over the long haul. Joe, you compare and contrast. I mean, Ricky, for productivity, is it, it was unheralded. Well, I, I like to look at it a little bit bigger picture. You, you certainly take a look at the numbers of these two men. They both put up big numbers. The thing is, is last year, the seven picks the Colts had, four and one on offense. You go and draft a Peyton Manning. Now you've got your quarterback. What's the next element that you need to get on your football team? You took a wide receiver last year. You've got that. Where do you want to go? You got rid of Marshall Falk. I think you have to go the running back. Now you're going to complete that side of the ball. Then you can build through free agency in the draft the defensive side. But offensively, you're going to be set, not just for now, but for quite a period of time. Well, I think this might be your first real curveball in the draft. I just do. I know Ricky Williams. I mean, we've been talking about him almost for two years, if not for one year. But if the Colts go running back, which I think they're going to do, don't be surprised if it's the other one, Edger and James. 
His signability may be a little bit different. That will raise a lot of eyebrows. A lot of people didn't think that a two and a five for Marshall Falk was enough, but yet Marshall will be a free agent at the end of the year, will be very tough to sign. Bill Polian and the Colts were very happy with what they got in that trade for St. Louis. And now, one tee shot. Here comes a shot into the green. Both shots, Mort, that we didn't expect him to take. I think he's going with the other back, Edger and James. Mortimer? Uh, Chris, I think signability is always an issue with Bill Polian. Just look at his experience with uh, Bianca Batuka in Carolina. Pulled out, injury, and a, and a so, somewhat busted career so far. And no question, signability was an issue with Marshall Falk. And by the way, there are other teams with a higher grade on Edger and James than Ricky Williams. Surprising as that is, Chris. Uh, Mortimer, the, uh, the Colts, I'm sure they took a last-ditch phone call from a team or two. But they've got the quarterback. Remember, they drafted Payton, wide receiver next. They can move the ball. And now they need a running back to take a little pressure off Peyton Manning. We set all sorts of passing records last year. They don't want him to set those same sort of records this year. They'd rather lug it. Is there activity up at the podium? Let's go up to the podium and get the pick from the Indianapolis Colts. With the uh, fourth choice in this draft, the Indianapolis Colts select Edger and James, running back, University of Miami. Ricky is, Ricky is obviously disappointed, and, and he's wondering what's happening. Now, was it just a swami crystal ball that I just thought up? But they're both special backs. And now, what do you think, Mel, that Ricky Williams is five or lower? Well, you might have had something to do, certainly, with sign ability. I had Ricky Williams one on the draft for Edger and James two, and I don't, don't know if a lot of people out there had Edger and James rated that high. I didn't put him over Williams, because Williams did it over a longer period of time. But as I said earlier, when James was on, he was unstoppable. You watch a kid here, athletic and great tackles, and then turn on the jet, and I think that's the difference here with Edger and James. Big back, who has size, has speed, and has toughness. Very fluid runner. Also, the outfitting hand coming out of the backfield then the moves in the broken field that ability after the catch for a kid who's strong and powerful has kind of a gliding style joke sets up his blockers flips the tackle continues on down the field 17 touchdown runs this past season this kid smells the end zone and he made a lot of big plays out of the running game joe late in the year particularly against ucla in their big upset win and also against nc state in the bowl game but is that enough joe to overtake ricky williams i don't think so i, I think I think you really know a little bit more of what you get with Ricky Williams. I'll tell you right now, Ricky Williams is pissed, flat out upset. And if you get an athlete upset, he's got a chip on his shoulder. He's going to have something to prove. Whoever gets Ricky Williams is going to have an athlete that's really going to want to prove a point. But it also creates a major problem for the Washington Redskins. They want Champ Bailey, okay? Now, now you've got Ricky Williams sitting there. They certainly need a running back. It not only muddles the water as far as what the trade will be possibly with New Orleans, but now Charlie Casserly and North Turner have to sit there and say, wow, we never expected both of these athletes to be here. Now we have to make a choice. Which way do we go? Joe, they had Skip Hicks. You know, they drafted Skip Hicks last year out of UCLA. They had Steven Davis. They have a back in Skip Hicks that they really think has a chance to be a great back. Do they go with Skip Hicks and roll the dice and keep him in the fold, or do they go with the back here and still stick with Champ Bailey? Well, we know that, and we heard from Ed Warder in New Orleans earlier, that Washington and New Orleans were, were mixing up a little cocktail there. Is it still on the bar, Ed? Well, Chris, you know, they're very excited about the possibility of getting Ricky Williams with this pick. The problem is the deal they had worked out with the Redskins for this pick was contingent upon the player the Redskins wanted being gone. And the guy they wanted is still on the board, Champ Bailey. So now it looks like the Saints may have to not only negotiate with the Redskins, but if that deal falls through and the Redskins take Bailey, they're going to have to get on the phone and talk to the Rams, Chris. Well, now nah, let me give you another scenario, Ed. They're going to get on the phone. Mike Dick is going to get on the phone and talk with the Chicago Bears at the seventh spot. That will be an interesting phone call all unto itself. Ed, let's uh, any other uh, deals that may be happening in New Orleans? I mean, they, they probably have talked five Washington, six St. Louis, seven Chicago, as far down as eight Arizona. Well, Chris, they, they've already had discussions uh, with the Bears at the seventh spot, but they didn't think it was to get Ricky Williams. It was to get... Uh, possibly David Boston with that pick, assuming, of course, at that point that Ricky Williams was already going to be off the board. So even if Williams goes uh, five or six here, I still think you might see the Saints trade up to try to get Boston. So this pick should take 
the limit of 15 rounds. If you've never watched an NFL draft before, hope the refrigerator is stocked. Um, each first round pick, and there are 31 of them, there's 15 minutes, and the second round is 10 minutes. But thus far, Ricky Williams, a wonderful player. Ricky thus far has lost that number. We'll be back. The 1999 NFL Draft is brought to you by Southwest Airlines. With fares so low, you have the freedom to fly. By 1-800-CALL-ATT for collect calls. And by AXA and the Equitable. Start building your financial future today. Back in New York at the 64th NFL Draft. Began back in 1936. And this one may be one of the more historic by the time it is over. Let's go back down to New Orleans and see if the trade did indeed go down. Ed? Well, Chris, the uh, Ricky Williams wait is just about over. The Saints have just completed a trade with the Redskins for this pick, and they will take Ricky Williams. Uh, terms of that not known at this time when I was on the phone with the War Room. The celebration was so loud at that point, I was unable to get the details right now. But I'll, I'll pursue those and get back to you. So a, a party already underway in New Orleans, and that's a town that doesn't really need an excuse for a party. Boy, Mike Ditka was so outspoken with him, what he wanted to trade for Ricky Williams. And you know what? He's got his man. Let's go up to the podium and join the commissioner. Yep. You know, when it's a trade card, it takes a little longer to fill out. And we, we thought this was ready to go, but first they read the trade, Joe. Especially when you talk about this kind of a trade. When There's a whole bunch picks. of numbers. Yeah, it's not like, here's a one, here's a two. It's a one, it's a two. It's everything in, in 99. It's part of 2000. And Ricky can't be disappointed because he's going someplace where somebody really expects him to contribute, wants him to contribute, and he will be embraced and needed to play there in New Orleans to give them some semblance of a running game. Well, let's see if this is indeed the moment for the most prolific back in terms of yards in Division 1A history. I think he's going to be sensational. I really oh, do. I do, too. I, I think him. he's, I think he's I going to be a terrific football player. And the only reason he's fallen is simply because of needs of other football teams, not because it's a reflection on his ability. Well, Mike Ditka loves him. There has been a trade involving this uh, fifth pick in the draft. The New Orleans Saints are now on the clock. Well, it won't be on the clock for long. So the Saints have moved up, and now Ricky knows. And, and you know what? He's going to a place where he is going to be embraced, and he is going to get the ball immediately because there's an offense that, well, Mike Ditchett knows a little bit about some decent backs. Sweden is the all-time leader in the pros. Now he gets the all-time leader in college football, Ricky Williams. Well, he does, and I think Ricky Williams is a phenomenal back, but they still have a quarterback problem in New Orleans. Billy Joe Hobart off an Achilles tendon injury. He gets a great back. Really, he's going to have to, Ricky's going to have to carry that offense because I think the triggerman still to be determined. I'm not a Billy Joe Hobart supporter as a starting quarterback in this league. Billy Joe, everybody named Billy Joe and Bobby Joe is, is on the New Orleans depth chart, a quarterback. you got to be a Joe if you're there. But they know how to hand off, <laughs> and they'll learn awfully quickly. Ed Werder, back, uh, back to New Orleans. What? What's the latest? Has the reveling died down? Uh, probably not, but uh, enough so that I was able to get the terms of the deal. Uh, the Saints are going to get him cheaper than they expected. Uh, they're giving up their, their all of their draft this year uh, and next year's number one and uh, number three pick. So they get Ricky Williams for less than some people might have imagined. Chris, they couldn't be more excited. Mike Diffie came in with a big cigar here today. I think he just lit it up. Well, that was his head, his original offer that was out there for about a week or so. All my draft and a one and a three next year. So, I mean, he's paying dearly. Is this too much to pay for a player of this sort? I don't think so. I, I, you know, we talked about him, and Mel had him rated as the number one player in the draft. When you're talking about the number one rated player in the draft, I don't think any price is too high to pay, especially if you're in a situation where Mike Dick is, and you say to yourself, I can't run the football. I've not been able to run the football, and I am the man that likes to run the football. Everything I do is based off that. I don't think it's too much. Let me ask you this, Joe. Billy Joe Hobart, the starting quarterback, off an Achilles tendon injury. Is this a package with Williams and Hobart they can win with? I think it's a package that it's a foundation to start with. I think they're going to have to go find a quarterback at some point in time, and I think they'll be able to. Let me just tell you what the picks are. A 12th round overall pick in this year. They have no second to the Saints, so the Skins now get a 1, a 3, a 4, a 5, a 6, and a 7, and a 1 and a 3 next year. Meanwhile, Indianapolis turned some heads. Heads are in James, not Ricky Williams. Sean Salisbury, you're with the coach of the Colts, Jim Mora. Sean? Thanks, Boomer. Coach Mora. 
You talk about Ricky, everybody, Ricky Williams, Ricky Williams, surprised the world with Edger and James. Well, we like both backs. We think they're both outstanding backs and are, and are going to be very good backs in the, in the National Football League. But basically, we feel that uh, Edron gives us a little bit more what we want to do with our offense, and uh, that's why we picked him. Now, I know that the uh, Saints came at you with a big offer also, plus a couple extra veteran players. Why not take that? Is Edron James that good? Well, we like him in, in a lot, and uh, we just felt like to get a back of that caliber um, at, at this point, uh, fr from a standpoint of our offense and, and how he fits in with, with the rest of our young guys on offense, that uh, we just felt like we needed to have him. Boomer, they got their running back and quarterback. Let's go back to you. All right, John and Coach Moore, thank you very much. And now music to the ears of Mike Ditka in New Orleans as it is about to be made official. With the uh, fifth pick in the draft, the New Orleans Saints select Ricky Williams, running back, University of Texas. You know what, a couple of years from now, even later on this year, nobody will care that you didn't go one, two, three, four, or five, you know, and you went five instead of one. If you gain what we think Ricky Williams is gonna gain, 13, I mean, I don't wanna put a number on it, you gain that, who will care? that it, you weren't the first overall pick in the draft. That doesn't mean anything. And from an economic standpoint, yeah, I, mean, I don't think there, but no, what? I don't think it will. I think you have to treat him like the number one pick in the draft from an economic standpoint as well. I mean, right, Mel? I mean, I mean, yes, economically is the difference, but so what? If he's going to play 10 years, plenty of chance to make it up, and he's not going to suffer at number five anyway. And if you think he was motivated last year when he, hides, when he won a Heisman Trophy, wait till this coming season and the season to come when he goes into the NFL with something to prove. You see Earl Campbell here. You're going to see that same style. There's Isaiah Robertson. You see the same style. That's why they call him Little Earl, the way he just stampedes the finish. There's Dave Elmendorf. Dave former Elmendorf. Rams. Good job, Mel. I mean, you're looking at a back who can break tackles, has incredible quickness, and has that ability that I think when you talk about a 234-pounder, he can run away from people in the secondary. And that's the difference. I think when you look at Ricky Williams, you're looking at a complete football player. You see the speed here with the pads on. I don't care how much he runs his 40 time is. With the pads on, and there he is wearing number 11, what's number 34, then the number 37, memory of Doak Walker. And here he is catching the football out of the backfield. Then making people miss in the open field. Combination of speed and power. Here against A&M, Joe, he breaks the record. Another tremendous run. Tackle break, speed, turns it on. Defensive back had the angle, he still gets it in the end zone. This is a tremendous football player, and as I said, Chris, now you get him here the Saints, you get Ricky Williams with an attitude to say, hey, take another running back ahead of me, let me drop down to five, I'm gonna prove everybody wrong. First thing about attitude, if you're wondering if the Saints play the Colts this year, they do not, so they'll have to wait till at least another season. Number two about attitude, the relationship between now the late Gulf Walker and Ricky Williams was legitimate and heartfelt, and I think that speaks volumes about the young man. I mean, he really developed a kinship with Gulf Walker the last couple of years. I think that tells you more about the guy. But Mike Dick already summed that up himself. Let's go down to New Orleans and join Ed Werder with the coach. I'm here with Coach Mike Ditka, who uh, just lit up his celebratory cigar, and it looks, it looks like you may be smoking that for some time. This could last three or four weeks. <laughs> what was it like going through that draft wondering if the Colts were, when they wouldn't make the trade with you, whether they were going to take the player you wanted. Well, we really thought they were. And, it, you know, we tried with everybody. Bill has been on the phone for a week and actually very, very much this morning. And uh, we thought maybe we could get something done. I mean, I, I thought that the offer we made was uh, beyond reason, but uh, I guess other people have their own feelings about that. I, I believe things are supposed to happen for reasons, and I think he's, he's supposed to come here. I mean, I really believe that. I, I, I love the kid. I love everything about him. I watched uh, every player, and I, there's a lot of great football players in this draft. And we would have been happy with some other ones, but I tell you what, he's what we need. We really need this kid, and I think, uh, I think he's going to show everybody, too, that he is the best college football player coming out. I don't care about the other guys. I think he might come in a little bit angry, given that Edger and James went ahead of him? No, nah, I don't think Ricky's that kind of kid. I really don't. I don't think he worries about that. I think he just knows he's got a job to do. He's going to come in and do it to the best of his ability, and we're going to become a much better football team because of him. Be beyond what he does... Uh, on the football field for you. Does he give you an identity that you sorely lack? Well, he gives us what Walter Payton gave us in Chicago. He gave us uh, what Walter Payton did, you know, in Chicago. I mean, you've got a great running back. You give him the ball. It makes your offense better. It makes your passing game better, hopefully. 
and it makes your defense better because they're not on the field as much. And if they want to put eight and nine men up front to stop them, we'll find a way to combat that because we think we can. And he's also a pretty good receiver now when you take him out of the backfield, but I don't think that's what you want to do with him too much. Well, you have no more picks now. You look like you're dressed for a, an evening out. Uh, what will you do with the rest of the day? Gone golfing. You want me to sing? If you'd like. What? On a shady Sunday day or Saturday, whatever it is. What was the reaction in your room when James was passed and you knew you had the deal in place with the Redskins? It was pretty calm except for me and Danny and, and uh, Tom and Bill and everybody else. Because uh, he's the player, you know, I guess maybe you make a mistake when you make a commitment like I made early and I said this, I'd give up my draft for him and this and that. And, but I would, and I meant it. I wasn't kidding. I don't believe in playing the games that some of these teams play. I mean, everything is so much intrigue, it kind of tickles me to death. I mean, if every people were that smart, what the hell, they ought to know who they want. Okay, Mike Ditka gets the only player he wants and the rest of the day off. Boomer, back to you. <laughs> All right, Ed and Coach, thank you. You know what I love? <laughs> there are 30 other coaches and GMs, et cetera, that are, that are you know, sweating this thing out for two days. And Mike is now going to work on his handicap for the weekend. I, I think it's great. I, I, here is the trade, as we spoke to you before, to swap. And Washington, remember, only drops down to seven slots now. It's not like they dropped out of the first round. So they swap first-round picks, and then Washington gets a three, a four, a five, a six, and a seven this year, and a one and a three in the year 2000. Y2K, if everything works. So that's what Washington gets out of it. And the Saints get their guy, and the, and the, coach, and the coach goes golfing. It, again, Mel, I want to ask, is this too steep a price, or if a guy is going to be this good, do you, do you agree with what Mike did, or do you agree with Washington? Who got the better of this? I think it's a lot to give up. I really do. Uh, like I said, Ricky Williams was the number one player in the draft. The only problem is he dropped the five, and to go up to five to get the number one player, you know, if you're talking about a Saints team that was one player away, maybe you would agree. I still think they have to get that quarterback. Billy Joe over off the injury. Billy Joe Tolliver, a career backup. They need the quarterback to get the job done. And I think when you look at it from the Redskin perspective, a lot of needs. They need those hole fillers. I've always been an advocate of moving down. Now they're set for next year's draft. They can utilize that 12th pick to help out the offensive line. But they do lose out on Champ Bailey and Chris McAllister, who would have been tremendous additions to that Redskin secondary. Heisman Trophy winners were running backs in the NFL. Some of them have made their mark for all time. A guy named Barry Sanders, who was drafted 10 years ago uh, in the number three slot. Tony Dorsett, Hall of Fame. Marcus Allen will be Hall of Fame. The Juice, Earl Campbell, Herschel Walker. These are some of the Heisman Trophies who have really made their mark. Now, of course, it's not 100%. It's not even 90%. But if Little Earl can become Big Earl, Mike Ditka will have a deal well worth it. We'll be back with St. Louis on the clock. ESPN2, the 99 NFL Draft, followed by X in Concert and NHL Tonight. And on ESPN Classic, Behind the Fight and College Basketball Classics. Have all the ESPN networks. The St. Louis Rams, who have been a busy week and a major factor in this draft before they even stepped up to the plate, which they are on the clock right now, by making a trade two days ago for Marshall Falk get a running back that they covet, get a running back who was a former number two draft pick in the uh, entire draft, in exchange for a two, a high two, and a five. So the Rams are on the clock, who now have a choice uh, in either defensive back, the Deion Sanders, if you will, Champ Bailey, or Chris McAllister, if you will, some repair, uh, compare him to Ronnie Lott. That's coming up. Ricky Williams, though, has a home, and his home right now is with Mike Tirico. Michael? All right, Chris, thank you. Ricky, I was watching you as you were standing backstage. In 10 minutes, you went from being passed over for another running back to being traded for, and in return, the other team got seven future players. Right. What was your range of emotions in those 10 minutes? Well, um, I think I expected Andy to take me because in talking to him, they sounded very interesting, so I was kind of surprised that they, they passed on me, but uh, excited I'm going somewhere where I'm really wanting. Were you mad? Mad? No, I wasn't mad at all. When you look ahead now, do you have something to prove to people because you were the second back taken in this draft? I don't think so. I'm just going to go out there and play football the way I always do. I'm not worried about proving anything to anyone. 
Some people talked about some things that have gone on since the Heisman period in the banquet circuit and your weight. Did you think that showed people that you weren't disciplined enough to do what you needed to do to be ready for the most important day of your professional life, which is up to now, today? Well, I'm sure they could have taken it that way, but uh, I, I know what I can do, and I've done it for four years, so hopefully I can keep on doing it. Signability. Some people thought that may be a question. Your agent, Master P, who is a multi-millionaire and a very successful businessman, but not experienced in the world of football and negotiating. Mm -hmm. Do you think that was something seen by some people as a negative? I, I don't know. I'm sure. I'm sure it could have been, but um, it's it's their first contract. We'll see how that goes, and in the future they won't have this problem. I don't know if you got a chance to see Coach Ditka. Big Hawaiian shirt, huge cigar. Uh -huh. He's going off to celebrate because he's done for the rest of the day. Yeah. He said he wanted you, and he got you. What does that make you feel like? It feels great. I was down there last week, and they were talking about uh, how all the coaches were saying, you know, if we draft you, you can just go home and you know, hit the golf course and, and get home early instead of being there all, all weekend. So I think all the coaches are excited, and I'm also excited about being the same. That's the good news, but you follow football. You know people talk about the Herschel Walker trade and all those picks. People are going to talk about the Ricky Williams trade down the line. You've carried a lot of burdens all the way through here. Are you ready to carry that burden into the pros? I'm not too worried. I'm just going to go out there and do all I can do. And if it's not good enough, I, I tried my best. And if it isn't, great. Well, you handled this like you've handled every step along the way. Class, good luck. Thank you. All right, Ricky. All right. Boom, back to you. All right, Michael. All right, Ricky. Congratulations going to the Saints. And just look at these numbers. Hard to get more gaudy than this. NCAA record. He passed Tony Dorsett for career yards of 6,200 plus. Yards to carry, breaking the record of the two-time Heisman Trophy winner, Archie Griffin. Anthony Thompson had the rushing touchdown record, broken. Touchdowns in two seasons, broke Barry. Broke Marcus Allen's record of 200-yard games. I mean, not only are they records, he's breaking names, records of guys that are that went down to be pretty darn good, Mel. Oh, he did it all. I think when you look at what he did at the college level, phenomenal productivity. I think when you look at the best available player, Ricky Williams. Let's look at some of the other top players in the draft. Edron James, Tim Couch already off the board. Champ Bailey dropping down a little bit further than some clubs may have anticipated. It's going to be interesting to see. You look at, at the Torrey Holt, outstanding mm -hmm. wide receiver from NC State. You know, you have some cornerbacks still there. Will the Redskins still be able to get a corner down the line? Will St. Louis go for offense? They got Marshall Falk, now they can get Holt, or will they go for the defensive back? So, look for you, who are options for teams than they may have expected going in? Great, what a great, interesting pick for St. Louis, and they've made it. Let's go up to the podium. With the uh, sixth pick in the draft, the St. Louis Rams select Torrey Holt, Wide receiver, North Carolina. Well, even with Champ Bailey there, they stuck to their plan late last night, which was Holt Mel. Very polished receiver, Chris. He went back for his senior year, worked all summer on his route running. Watch him set up the cornerback, catch the deep ball here. You see the route running, you see the polish, the hands, everything very effortless for Torrey Holt. That came this year. Like I say, studied hard during the summer, worked on his route running, and here, the vision, the eyes. Watching the quarterback, working with the quarterback, making a tough reception. Watch the concentration here. And back to the senior. As a junior, he made a lot of uh, improvement during the course of this past season. Touchdown reception with his hand. Here's a punt return against Florida State. He can get wide and then turn on the speed, break a tackle. So you're looking at a kid who has a great deal of athletic ability. Not sprinter screen, uh, Chris, but a guy who certainly can burst out of his break and make plays again on the deep ball against Florida State. Also, the knee injury. Sustained a minor knee injury Tuesday prior to the senior bowl. Has up the minor surgery. You're looking at Torrey Holt doing his individual workout. Run between 4-3-6 and 4-4-4. Caught everything thrown in his direction. That solidified a position for Torrey Holt in the top 10 overall and allowed him to remain ahead of David Boston as the number one wide receiver in this draft. Well, we've had six offensive players, three quarterbacks, two running backs, and a wide receiver go thus far. And now on the clock on the seventh pick was Chicago. But before we could even say this was a hot spot, it got, well, it got red hot because the Chicago Bears and Washington Redskins have worked the trade. Washington doesn't have an owner, but they've been on the clock twice already. Mort, what do we have? Well, I think what you have here is now the Redskins' best case scenario. They get all the picks with New Orleans, and now they go up to get Champ Bailey, the player they coveted all along. And all I can tell you is I had a good conversation with Charlie Cassidy this week about protecting the integrity of this draft, knowing that he and North Turner could be on very short-term contracts. And he said, Mort, you just don't worry about those things. You just draft like you would normally draft as if you're going to be there for five more years. So right now, this is a great scenario for the Redskins with Champ Bailey. And the Bears move back, I think, at 12, looking at Cade McNown, the UCLA quarterback, Chris. Yeah, he 
should be there, but may not be. But that, that's a risk they'll take. And Washington, you're right. Um, no, they, they get the people's champ, it looks like. We'll see if that's what they do. But let's go up to our Bristol uh, locale and join Mark Malone and Ron Jaworski. And guys, your thoughts on offense, offense, offense. I know you can respect that. <laughs> well, we certainly can, Boomer, no doubt about it. Dick Vermeil and the St. Louis Rams had a lot of needs, and, and some of those needs on the defensive side of the football. They needed a cover corner, and they needed some linebackers, but they chose Torrey Holt. Why is that, Ron? Mark, just before the draft started, I talked to Coach Vermeil, and it was clear to him that he wanted to build an explosive offense. When you look at the new quarterback in Trent Green, you look at Isaac Bruce, you look at Marshall Falk, now you throw in a Torrey Holt, you have playmakers. This is an offense that was really sputtering last year. It may be the best turnaround of any team right now through the draft, through free agency, and through trades. They have really upgraded their team. No doubt about it. They are explosive. Got some problems on the defensive side of the ball that they still have to address. Meanwhile, the Washington Redskins are still on the clock. We'll be back with more coverage of ESPN's 1999 NFL Draft right after this. good knows evil knows that having a formidable partner is definitely good chevy s10 like a rock Now you can fly Southwest Airlines coast to coast for $99 or less when you purchase tickets by April 27th. You are now free to move about the country. Robin and I are going to Cooperstown together, and nobody's going to care that I got 98% of the vote and you only got 77. Yeah, just like nobody's going to care I won more MVP awards, George. We'll be too busy celebrating with New York. And the trade and the pick by the Redskins are ready to rumble. Let me give you the specifics on the uh, sh Chicago trade with Washington. To obtain uh, this pick from Chicago, the seventh pick in the first round, the Redskins traded to the Bears. The uh, New Orleans Saints first round pick in this year's draft. New Orleans Saints third round pick in this year's draft. Washington's fourth and fifth round picks in this year's draft, as well as a third round pick in the next year's draft. And with, with the seventh pick, the Washington Redskins select Champ Bailey, defensive back, University of Georgia. Well, if you get eight draft picks, you might as well deal some of them away, I guess. So they got eight, although they really struggled. They got seven additional picks to the Redskins. So as we read it, they've given away four picks. So they, they, they're up three, still get the player they want. They don't have an owner. But they get a coach, they get a GM, and they got one hell of a player. And many GMs, Mel told me, by far and away, Champ Bailey was their favorite player in the entire draft. Well, I think when you look at the trade, Chris, you were they would have had to be very fortunate to see a Champ Bailey or a Chris McAllister drop down. Joe, we were trying to look at it and see if they would be fortunate enough to see that happen. They weren't going to gamble that that would happen. Move back up to get the Champ Bailey. He was the guy that they had keyed on all along. Daryl Green getting up there in age. Can't go one forever. Dishman off the down here. They needed a big corner in Washington. 5'11 and a half, 184 pounds. Champ Bailey. Outstanding in coverage here against Tennessee. Peerless Price comes away with the interception. Talk about his great hands. The Ball skills of heat arise. Wide receiver, he's outstanding. Applies that ability and coverage. There again, the pass deflects, and he's tough. Watch this, Joe. This is a kid who's a hard nose, good run support, tough football player. Here again, solid tackle after the catch. Now you'll see him coming on the corner, blitz. Moving in for the sack against Auburn. Now on the other side of the ball. We saw the hands in terms of the interceptions. Now at wide receiver. A double threat, also a return man. Another touchdown reception against Virginia in their bowl game. The kid is a remarkable athlete. I think the question you have to look at if you're the Washington Redskins, how much do you work him on wide receiver? I think if you look at the Redskins' perspective, they need him so desperately at corner to be the next Darryl Green. They don't want to really have him worrying about so much. He played 95% of the plays in Georgia. That was too much. 
Now he'll be just a corner early on, maybe down the road, Joe. If they need a big play, maybe a little wide receiver. Let me answer your question first. I don't think he works at all on offense. I think he exclusively works on defense because we don't really know how good Champ Bailey can be because he never really had a chance to focus totally on defense when he was at Georgia. Kudos to Charlie Casserly, North Turner, and everybody there. You made the trade. You made a move up. You protected yourself, got one of the players you covered in one in the first round. I think that's just an excellent move. You take a look at the secondary. They've acquired Sam Shade this year. You got Lamont Evans at free safety. Chris Dishman. Chris is getting a little bit older. Can be a great tutor for Champ Bailey. Daryl Green continues to play at a very high level. It helps this secondary out tremendously. And it's going to really help the side of the ball that needs an awful lot of help. And that's the defense of the Washington Redskins. The deals for the tackles last year, now you get a corner, you make a deal for a safety, the pieces are starting to come together. An opportunity maybe, just maybe, for whoever winds up owning this football team to say, hey, these guys are doing a pretty good job. I think I'll keep around. Well, maybe so. You're going to start singing? Well, you like to pick, I know, because if it can be anywhere close to Daryl Green, oh. 16 years and still going strong, he's going to be a heck of a player. The importance of having a top notch cornerback in the NFL, you ask around the league, cannot be understated. First of all, the most important thing on defense is pressure on the passer. Now, how does that relate to the corner? If you have great cover corners, you can send more people to the quarterback. It's that simple. It's so important today with the changing offenses uh, from a defensive standpoint to be able to take a side away or a particular player away. And I think that's why there is uh, uh, a sudden a sudden move in the direction of the cornerback position. When you look at a team that you consider a championship caliber team, that's one of the areas you look at, look at immediately because that's one of the areas that if you are subpar out there and you give up some plays, it's going to cost you games. You've got athletes at receiver nowadays that can make an awful lot of big plays and make them real fast. Uh, you've got uh, defenses that are that are uh, becoming more zone blitz oriented, more blitz oriented, putting more pressure on the corner and requiring a better player at the position. The more and more empty sets we see with five wide receivers, uh, the four wides, the three wides now is, uh, is, is standard. A third cornerback is a starting position anymore in the National Football League. Uh, it's just a reaction to what the offense does. The defense has to counter. And so uh, those quality corners, and especially the so-called shutdown corners who can lock out a receiver, uh, are as valuable as any defensive player you have. Well, Washington certainly knows all about it, having had Darrell Green in for a couple of years while he was you know, still great Chris Dishman. And now they hope that Champ Bailey can fit that mold. Well, Champ Bailey is one of the most exciting college players we've seen in quite a long time. Why don't we go up to the guys who watched him week in and week out, and that's our fellows in Bristol, uh, Coach Gottfried. Kirk Herbstreet with our man, Chris Fowler. Chris? All right, Boomer, anybody who watched Georgia play saw a lot of Champ Bailey guys. He played more than 90 plays per game his senior year. That's more plays than anybody really in the modern era of college football when you look at his 1998 season. Played so many plays, Mike, that at times it was kind of unfair to judge him as a defensive back because he played so much receiver, also played on special teams. He got tired a lot, but when he was not tired, he was truly great. Uh, he's an impact player. You talk about a great player. 4 3 40, 42 inch vertical jump. Plays on offense, defense, specialties. Teams does it all. But very long arms, which allows him to jam the receiver. Here he's against Peerless Price of Tennessee. Doesn't let him off the football. Excellent ball skills with the interception. He can blitz off the corner. You talked about Chris. He averages over 100 snaps per game. Good hands. He practices 20 minutes with the offensive football team and then goes in and uh, makes big plays on offense. His speed is excellent. I've talked to a lot of pro uh, people and they talked about if he was a wide receiver only, he'd be a top three pick. And when you look at Champ Bailey, you're maybe looking at the next Deion Sanders, Kirk. Well, I don't know if he's the next Deion Sanders because I question his ability to play wide receiver. People comparing him and looking at a Deion Sanders, think of the offensive skills Chris and I saw him play against Tennessee. He got winded. He got tired early in that game, had to step out, and they pr tried to play him just primarily at the corner position. He is legitimate, one of the best cornerbacks in the draft. I like Chris McAllister, the long arms. He can play man-to-man -man as well as anybody. He fits in well with the system. That's why I think it's tough for, to judge him as a defensive back. He did get very tired in that Tennessee game, ended up giving up a touchdown pass, but that's because he was on the field constantly. Obviously, won't ask to be do that in the NFL. Now, the comparisons with Charles Woodson last year's Heisman Trophy winner are obvious. You can see that Bailey had a much bigger impact on offense. Georgia, frankly, needed a big impact on 
offense. They were lacking in big plays, and Bailey wasn't in there as a receiver. Defensively, some would say a, perhaps a different kind, less physical defensive back than Charles Woodson, but Champ Bailey headed to Washington. But the number seven pick will continue our NFL draft coverage from New York and Bristol with the Cardinals on the clock.